I was trying to understand how could that, how could I get those feelings? How could I get my practice with my kids in football to replicate what it's like to play a video game? Welcome to the Liverpool FA podcast. Our aim is to provide regular insight from a variety of experts to help you in your own football journey. We'll do it through interviews, roundtable discussions and by linking to other resources to help support you. For more information about each episode, just tap the album art, which will provide you with more about our guests and links to further content. Our guest today is Amy Price. Amy is a lecturer at St Mary's University in Twickenham. 18 months into her professional doctorate, she is exploring how digital video game design principles can be used in teaching and coaching games, and in particular football. Amy is currently coaching at Fulham with their under-7s group and with the women's university team. Alongside this, Amy is an affiliate tutor for the FA at Level 1, 2 and UA for B and is also an FA coach mentor in Surrey. Amy and I managed to find a couple of hours free first thing on a Sunday morning to fit this in and I'm so glad that we did. I had my mind completely blown away by some of the ideas that Amy put across and we think you'll really enjoy this one if you're interested in taking your practice design to a new level, if you'll excuse the pun. The show notes for this one are rammed with all sorts of videos and articles that Amy has recommended and Amy has kindly put together some example session plans that she's used in practice that relate to the principles in our discussion. There's a download link in the show notes or on my Twitter at JackWalton1. Amy is also delivering a free CPD event at Surrey FA on March the 7th, where much of the content will be put into practice with young players. And I've collared our colleague Pete Augustine to film the event, which we'll get out on YouTube shortly afterwards. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did with Amy Price. Let's crack on, shall we? All right, Amy Price, uh, welcome to Liverpool. Thank you very much. I believe it's your first time in a city, is that right? It's my first time, yep. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing what it's all about. Tell us why you're up here in the North West then. Kind of a weird one, really. But back in November time, I had this urge to, to come and watch some some good teams play football. Um, so that's my weekend. Yesterday, I went to go and see Salford City, which was quite cool. Uh, did you? And how did they get on? Uh, they won 4-0 four, four or 3-0. Okay. So their fourth win on the bounce. Yeah. Um, but to be fair, I was kind of just there to get a glimpse of Gary Neville and Ryan Giggs, to be honest with you, um, which I gave Ryan Giggs a little wave through the window and he uh, gave me an awkward wave back. Oh, did he? It was literally the highlight of my weekend. <laughs> and, and you're up in Liverpool today for the City game? Yeah, Liverpool City today. Yeah. Um, as a Man City supporter, which is really weird because I'm actually a Man U supporter. Oh, OK, so, so you're, in, you're in the City end. <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. City end. And then, um, and then you're off to Old Trafford tomorrow night as well, is it? Yeah, watching um, Man U Stoke play tomorrow night, which I'm so excited about because being a typical Man U fan, it's only my second time Obviously. at Old Trafford. Yeah. So. Well, well, welcome to the, the North West. And um, yeah, it's your first time up this way, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And never, literally never been here before. And uh, yeah, this is the, probably the most difficult episode I've had to prepare for because since picking you up from the train station I've, I've been trying to avoid any conversation that we would likely to be repeated yeah. over the next uh, over the next hour and a half as tempting as it might be so we, we first met when you were coming through the tutor development pathway with the FA is that right? Yeah St George's Park yeah. so we, we spent sort of a year coming to St George's Park and learning the different steps in order to become a tutor yeah. um, met you on that course yeah and that was probably about three three or four years ago now is that right yeah yeah and then you've since kicked on and why don't you describe what what some of the roles that you're doing within football and beyond now um so since then yeah, obviously um level one and two tutor for the fa in surrey and the UEFA B licensed tutor as well um but sort of alongside since when we met i've been carrying on studying at university and, and working at university i'm a lecturer at st mary's university in twickenham and Coaching wise, working with the Fulham Pre Academy, the under sevens. So yeah. um, it's kind of good for me to have that balance of sort of academia, but also actually being able to coach as well. Yeah, so you're kind of applying what you're what you're doing in practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the perfect way to do it because, especially with the stuff that's going to come out of today, just yeah. seeing how it works. Yeah, and so and how are you finding the um, that that blend of of 
not only developing players but developing coaches what are, what are some of the, the highlights for you that, that are ongoing at the moment I think they complement each other to be honest I never really noticed I never really thought about that at the start but I think working with coaches it gets me thinking about and questioning myself and my own way of coaching um, in what ways because sometimes I think you you have an idea in your head about coaching and you share that with a coach and the coach questions you and then you realise oh Actually, yeah, I had, hadn't actually questioned that myself before. And then it just inspires you to, when you next work with your players, to try something different or to sort of probably better reflect on why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, so what would be one of those different things that you've tried then as a result of that with your players recently? Um, one of the things that came out of tutoring the level one um, when it first came out was the idea around not having to develop a different session or a different practice all the time. For the players that I worked with because through working with those coaches on the level one they kind of I remember there was one situation where a coach asked me that very question around oh how long would you um, deliver this practice for or how long would this session last I think when I thought about it I was like actually like I don't know how long's a piece of string it could go on for two or three sessions if, if it's developed well and then that that was really one key moment in in tutoring where I realized throughout my, my coaching journey before that I always felt like I had to deliver and design a new session every time until that coach asked. I can get where you're coming from then and I've got a, a couple of level one groups from a, a local club who I'm taking through their level one at the moment and the combined experience of working with players in, in the room is um, well on average about two or three months and I love working with that um, with, with those type of people because they're just so honest and so receptive and they ask some great questions that, that I've never even considered before like you say yeah. what well, you know how, how long should this last or how many practices should I do in a session and it, it really um, it grounds me and gets me it uh, keeps me honest I suppose that you know these these people make up the backbone of, of what is grassroots football in this country and we, we you know we can't forget that yeah 100% it's been an eye opener I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the level ones <laughs> okay so um, how did you get into this weird and wonderful world of, of coaching and, and coach development then in the first place um so sort of when I was growing up as a, as a child I had well I've got three older brothers um so as an as a sort of effect of that two of them sort of encouraged me to get in, into playing football and we used to play football in the garden all the time and so what, what's session. the age difference if you don't mind me asking um so my oldest brother is 41 so he's 11 years older than me you've just given your age right yeah now. I know I just realized that <laughs> Um, my next brother is um, 40. Actually, in fact, it's my oldest brother's 42. Um, next one stands 40, so 10 years. And then there's another brother who's six years away from me. So he, I spent so most of my time. It's quite a gap then. Yeah. A really big gap. But then the guy, the, the guy, the brother who's um, six years older than me, he, he doesn't like playing football and never has done. So I kind of spent a lot of time with him because he was near to me in age. So his thing that he liked to do, sort of, as me being the youngest gets bossed around, had to play video games with him all the time or doing stuff that doesn't involve being outside and playing, playing football. Whereas my older two brothers, I would always be out playing football with those two. Um, so that was kind of how I got into football and got a little obsession over, over playing. And that kind of makes sense for where this conversation is going to go in some of your research. But I, I'm interested to know what, what, what were the video games? And the reason why I ask is, the lads I knock about with here in Liverpool, we um, we have a WhatsApp group and there's quizzes and all sorts going on there. But one of the things that got sent around recently was one of those Telegraph or Guardian quizzes and it was like video games from the 90s. And I think we all scored pretty highly on that. So what, what were some of the games that you used to play with your with your eldest? Uh, Mortal Kombat. Yes, classic. Used to play all the time. And um, do you remember Mini, mini Micro Machines? Yeah. On, on the Mega Drive. Um, Lemmings, yeah. another one. But I remember the Mortal Kombat was the funniest because um, my brother, he's been six years apart, he's quite a lot bigger than me. If I beat him on the game, that would be it for the day. Like, he literally loses his temper with me. He like, being like little fights, like calling, mum, mum, blah, blah, he's beat me on the Mega Drive, blah, 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 blah. It turns into a massive argument. Um, but I always, I remember that game because I found a way of beating him. And if you got him in a head, if you got your opponent in a headlock, 
and just kept pressing down the B. <laughs> they could, there's no way that the other no, person could get out of it. No. And he found that extremely annoying, yeah. but it worked so well. There are so many middle-aged men and women up and down the country now listening to that, nodding their heads in agreement <laughs> with you, I think. Um, so yeah, zipping back then. So they, they were some of your your early experiences of, of, of growing up and, and you mentioned that sibling rivalry. What was, um, yeah, tell me a bit more about that. I don't know what it was. Um, probably my relationship with, with the brother who's... Yeah, He's, his name's Robert, he's six years older than me. Um, with My relationship with him, I think it was always competition between us. I don't know if that is because we literally played video games the whole time. Um, but I, I kind of felt like I had to beat him in whatever we did. Um, and as a result of that, when I went in to play football with my older two brothers, I kind of brought that with me. So um, I don't know if it's like a, an interest in, in games themselves from a young age, whatever the context was, um, because we also used to play a lot, this is probably the same for many families, but we used to play a lot of board games, a lot of random games at Christmas, like my grandparents came round with like, okay, telly's off, we're playing games. And I think from a young age, I just found myself always playing games, no matter what context that was in. And then as a result, so you have three older brothers, and then subsequently two half brothers who were younger, younger than me since then just always like engaged in some sort of competition with each other. So how did that translate into football then? So what, what, when, did you, when did you pick up and, and start to play football and how did this kind of love for games manifest itself within that? So I played for my first football team when I was, I was quite old really now when you look at how young players are now, but I was like 10 um, and I really sort of enjoyed just playing. Because the we didn't have a structured training session back then. It was just I well, was just going to play a match. Um, we might do the warm up of running around the pitch at the start, and maybe some sort of headers and volleys and partners, and then we just go and play a match. Was this mixed or girls? It was a girls team. Yeah, yeah. it's a like little league right. team down the road. And um, I always laugh when I look back because I used to think I was an amazing player at the time because I used to be the top goal scorer and stuff like that. When I look back, it, it makes me laugh because I was massive. And um, all the other girls in my team were tiny and we used to play on 11 aside pitches um, and some of the girls were only seven and with 11 aside goals and um, it makes me laugh so much because at the time I thought it was so good and now looking back I'm like oh my god literally only was successful because I was bigger than everyone yeah well the coach educator inside you understands that at least <laughs> now doesn't so um, and was that your was that your very first introduction to football then was it um literally going from nothing to a, a more formal girls team at 10 or was there any sort of steps in between that at school? Um, no, I think it, that, that literally was my first step. The only steps in between was <coughs> the sort of the more relaxed sort of playful environments that, well, sometimes not so playful when the competition came in with my brothers just in the garden. But yeah. How did that then lead you into, uh, into coaching? So what was your pathway between there and, and how you got into start developing players? Um, kind of, I started coaching, did my level one when I was 17. So I did the old, the old level one. Um, and I worked in Soul Trader at the time, a shoe shop, which I hated. And I wanted a level one so that I could have my part-time job doing something I loved, because I loved football. And get, again, at the time, I was like, oh, I'm going to get like £10 for this hour of coaching, doing something that I love, um, and put a lot of graft into that. Ended up getting into sessions like two hours early and leaving like an hour later. But... Luckily, as a result, it led me into the um, into a role at Fulham as like a youth training contract. So it was a um, full-time role. And I just used to coach in the community like on all the different types of stuff that was there. It was like soccer schools, after-school clubs, stuff like that. And um, I remember my very first soccer school where it's nine to, it started at 10 and finished at three for five days long. And it was my first coaching experience. I had, literally had my level one and went into that, had nothing in between. And all <laughs> I just remember thinking, oh my God, like these level one practices are just not gonna fill that amount of coaching time. And literally that was the biggest learning experience for my coaching, so far, of my coaching career, of how, what did I do in those situations? And I remember like some terrible practices that I was doing. Um, what, you know, such as? Such as find, so I had 18, 10 year olds on my own. So find a partner, ball between two, just pass to your partner, partner passes back. And I remember at the time thinking, 
oh my god like you know they're not concentrating they're not listening and the other side of the pitch was a really senior coach who'd like been there for ages and he was such a good coach and I remember looking over at his sessions and they looked amazing I was like oh wow that looks so good like everyone looks like they're enjoying it they're all doing all these different things with the ball and I used to look at mine and be like oh my god like I need to really seriously think about how do I get my practice to look like that practice I I can empathise with you there I remember being uh, a young coach or novice coach relatively out in the States for a company and I was sent to Green Bay in Wisconsin for a week and I had four girls I think between the ages of 8 and 14 to coach for six hours a day and I soon realised that you can have all the drill books all the practices that you want but nothing can replicate the experience of having to I suppose I learned it doesn't matter you can you know you can have all those playbooks but unless you can connect with the kids in the first place yeah. forget it because they'll eat you alive yeah. so what was it that you learned in that in that moment when you come away from your your first coaching qualification gone straight to a 15 hour camp over five days or so it's longer than that isn't it yeah 20, 25 hours over five days yeah what were you thinking? What did you did you do, and what did you learn out at the end of it? My thought after day one, at half past three, was I'm exhausted. First of all, and next thing was I need to spend the whole of this evening planning something that's going to last the day, but it's going to get them look like so they're having fun. And I and that was the main thing that came out of that was was enjoyment. I have to get my practices so they look like they're having fun. Um, did that not happen on day one no no they just looked like it was very structured it was there was misbehavior probably because they were bored um so that 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 idea of enjoyment really came out for me I was like they're going to be here for another four days and I really don't want any of the players or the parents like not turning up because that's a reflection on me um so I thought about this idea of enjoyment but then at the same time like I also thought about the idea of learning so I was like how am I going to get them to actually come away so they've improved but at the same time so they've like, absolutely loved it and they'll sign up to the next camp so joining up learning and enjoyment together somehow and so was that that was your first experience of formal coaching if you like yeah where then where, so you went I know you ended up at, at university but was it straight after what what happened next uh yes yeah, so I, I was I did various coaching roles um, where I would sort of experiment with that concept of merging learning with enjoyment as much as possible, um, but ended up at university at St Mary's in Twickenham and studied physical and sport education degree programme. And one of the things that came out of that was the concept of teaching games for understanding, um, which uses games to, um, as a practice design to engage and support the, un- the understanding of players. And um, when I saw that, I was like, that's it. That is exactly what I've been sort of struggling with over the last few years in terms of bringing learning and enjoyment together in my practices so kids are having fun and getting better. And then I found this teaching games for understanding model. Okay, so for those who are listening in who may have heard of it, some may not have, just describe or tell us a little bit more about what what teaching games for understanding is. Uh, So it was a concept that sort of came out in the 80s although I'm pretty sure there was similar concepts um, prior to that just hadn't came out really in the literature but um, Len Almond who was one of the creators of the approach was actually a student at St Mary's and um, getting to speak to him firsthand he he told me that it was all based around the idea of um, outwitting the opposition and that he noticed as he was a peer teacher in his early days he noticed that um, players were good at executing skills out of context. So going back to that practice that I told you that I thought was terrible when I got players in partners just passing, he noticed that a lot of players were good at doing stuff like that. Um, but when they went into the game, they didn't know you know, when to pass, how to pass, who to pass to. So all of the decision-making stuff that's attached to the technique and that was the stuff that he noticed players were lacking. So as a result, I mean, it was him and two of his colleagues who were all PE teachers, and it was um, an approach that originated 
in that sort of PE coaching, con- PE teaching context, but has floated into coaching just around getting players to become good decision makers and to actually understand the tactics of the game in order to outwit the opposition. What else did you learn from Len then when, when, in that conversation? So obviously there's there's some conceptual stuff there, but uh, did, you, did he take you for a module or did you just meet him in passing? How did this... No, so it was, it was a bit weird. Like I was working... Um, so I was a student at St Mary's and I completed my degree, um, but then I also started to work there after I completed my degree as a graduate assistant um, whilst doing my master's alongside that. So a little bit of teaching and studying at the same time. And that was when I first met him because at that point he was appointed as a professor at the university because he kind of retired and he still wanted to, he, he had such a passion for, uh, for games and for developing players that he just couldn't stay away and he, he was not, not living too far away. So he, he became a professor at the university and um, I got to meet him and have chats with him. And I mean, <laughs> we joke now, but he used to, uh, unfortunately he passed away um, last year, but he used to send us emails, me and my team, like literally at least twice a week to each of us, all different ones around his, his own thoughts around like the future of coaching and the future of of learning through games and, and all of this. He's just it's such an inspiring guy. I and bet there's some absolute gold in those emails, is there? Unbelievable, yeah. yeah. It's anything you fascinating. can share. Well yeah, I mean the first the first sort of thing that stood to my mind was this idea around outwit outwitting the opposition and how sometimes, you know, you can you can use that concept in any game. So if we rewind back at the start of the conversation when I said about video games or board games or football games or whatever it is, he would explain that this, it's all underpinned by this, this notion of it's all about outwitting the opposition. You have to understand the tactics and the strategies in order to be successful in the game. So um, this was actually another conversation that reconfirmed, that I had with Len, that reconfirms what I told you about when I had that chat with the level one coach. You asked me, how long should this practice last for? And Len was telling me that when they developed the approach, um, the idea that it was sort of a, he would call it a spiral curriculum. So because of how games are, he said that, it's, you know, it's, it's about um, something that's quite complex, a game. There's a lot of different elements to understanding a game. He said that, so rather than sort of breaking that down, he said, just simplify it. So rather than teaching the players how to play the game in a seven aside, you might just teach them how to play it in a three aside. And he was saying how like your first session might be around sort of a really simple version of the game. And that spirals into uh, something that's a little bit more complex, say a, I don't know, you can, it could be a four aside or it's up to you how you make it more complex tactically or not. But he was just explaining how it wasn't about doing a new session all the time. It was about keeping the game as a game and just making it a little bit more complex as it goes along, mm. not just starting from scratch with a different topic or a different thing to teach e- each week. Yeah, and I think that's always the temptation, isn't it, that we as coaches, we, we train on a Wednesday night, for example, uh, for one thing then we play our game on the s- Saturday or Sunday morning and then our next session is whatever X went wrong the previous game right let's focus on that and then and we end up kind of yeah. I call it the kind of whack-a-mole syndrome where you're just <laughs> constantly trying to uh, plug gaps that's so, exactly but, it yeah so at this point uh, you, you're a student at St Mary's you've been I think quite fortunate to come across somebody who's had such an impact on, on the coaching domain as, as that are you still coaching at this point or are you just putting everything into your studies? No, still coaching. So how are you then applying this this theory that you're that you're learning in your own coaching practice? So where, put us where you where were you coaching at this point? So during university I was coaching at Fulham's Girls Centre of Excellence for right. the under 10s, which again is really fortunate that it was an environment with coaches who um, were open mindset, quite forward thinking. I'd say like back then we didn't really have like a really like sort of like a philosophy like teams and clubs seem to have nowadays um, but it was just about this general feeling in the club of people um, working together and making people feel comfortable the environment I think was the key thing that came out of that context and um, 
that helped me when I was trying to apply these these sort of games things because I, I noticed that some of the coaches in the older age groups were not going down that road at all. And I think I was probably quite extreme and always using teaching games for understanding or some sort of game to coach my players. But I was kind of just left to go along with it with, with guidance, but not sort of like strong guidance. Yeah. So at the time, so how, what would one of your your games, your teaching games for understanding look like? And how would that be different to say a 4v4 match? Just open rules, what, what would be the differences there? So um, I remember I figured out that the bibs can be used as, um, well, you know, foxes and rabbits, the yep. game where you try and take the tails. Obviously I, I, I played that game lots of times with my kids, but I realized, oh, there's ways that you can link that into the tactical understanding of the players. And I spent ages, um, designing a session and, and and trying it out whereby I think it was focused around defending and it was the idea around um, if it's a 1v1 defending your body shape and and the approach that you might take in order to be successful in taking the bib and I got the players to wear the bib um, I think it was at the front the front of their shorts rather than the back um, because I wanted it to replicate a situation where the bib could be the ball and it was about the player trying to take the bib from the front of the shorts but then that was in a in a game so it was like a I had 10 players back then so it's like a five feet five game or something like that um I'd still use the ball but there was different like ways of scoring different rules that meant that they had to try and take the bib or the ball or both um so it still looked like football it just had a different little modification on it to get the players to, to, to understand and to think more explicitly around why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, and I suppose just by switching the bib from the front to the back mm. completely changes the tactical element or the way that you would then have to outwit your opponent to win the game. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and likewise, side, you know, one hip to the other potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So we explored like different ways of, don't get me wrong, I was just going, I, I was inexperienced, like I was just going along and trying stuff out, just practicing, designing stuff. Fast forward to, to your coaching nowadays with the, with the pre-academy at Fulham. Are you, are you still applying similar concepts? How, how has your practice evolved since, um, since those days? I'm still applying those concepts, but I think I've got a little bit more of an understanding now of, of other stuff that's out there and why I would use a certain approach to coaching compared to another one. So I might use teaching games for understanding or I might use more of a constraints-based approach, you know, Use, like using a clear scoring system and, and trying to get them to learn a little bit more implicit, implicitly. What would implicit? What? Um, so like through maybe using a game with my kids and saying it's a certain amount of points for scoring, a, you know, I don't know. could be like a risk and reward game. So if you score, if you make five passes before you score, it's worth six points because I'm encouraging them to keep possession of the play and uh, be more patient with their play but I haven't told them that I've just told them the scoring system so they're implicitly realising oh when do we need to keep the ball and build up points and when do we need to attack quicker to score a goal um, so I say that sometimes I use that like, implicit approach with, with the under sevens that I coach at the moment it's that's quite good for them because it's they just play they find out as they go along sometimes it's more explicit as I've described with teaching games for understanding where I'm like really guiding them towards the answer that I want them to try and understand so if it's about the bib thing about how to defend against somebody 1v1 that's me through questioning might really try and guide them to, towards the answer that I want them to find um, But and just on that then so when you're working with the say the TGFU uh, sorry teaching games for understanding will we'll abbreviate is TGFU when you're working with that approach, is there a single answer in mind often? or I don't think there's a single answer in mind. Um, well, I think when you're planning, and I think planning becomes really important, um, you plan with answers in mind, um, but they're not set answers. And I think it's still about the players finding the outcome and using their own process. So, for example, you know, I might have been able to take, take your tail from you uh, I might have done it in a way that you wouldn't have expected me to. So my body my body shape might have been not side on in that 1v1, but I still managed to get it or or whatever it might be. 
but that's not what I had in mind when I planned it, but I'm still happy for that to occur. Mm. Um, but I think it's important in TGFU that you do have an idea of some processes that players might go through in order to achieve the outcome. But I think that's probably quite a big difference compared to that. And you're just using a const- constraints-led approach where yeah. you just might be really open, not even planned types of processes that players might go through. And it's, it's very individualised thing for those uh, for those players yeah so jumping back you, you said you were working with the tens at the uh, at Fulham with the girls there and there was some differences in, in practice that you observed how did that make you feel what what were some of the um did you feel any sort of pressures in your own practice at Fulham I didn't I think it was it was really um an environment where everybody could to, could learn for themselves coaches and players Following on from that, because obviously Fulham lost its licence as a centre of excellence in 2011, which was when I graduated from university. So um, obviously went to different coaching environments and that was the first time I'd only ever been in Fulham. So when I went out into the big wide world of like real life, I was like, wow, like it's not the same in terms of what coaches expect coaches to be like. So were you now into grassroots or where were you? Where I was were you at another RTC yeah. um, and I was working with their under nines. So When you say RTC? A regional talent centre, so yeah. it's for the girls, um, sort of like a girls academy programme. I was with the under nine age group and they only trained once a week. They didn't have matches. And so considering, you know, what I've said about TGFU and how much I was interested in it and considering the fact it's a once a week training, they don't play matches and they're only nine. I was really excited about, oh, like, you know, helping them to to learn and understand and get better at decision making in that training session. And that, that definitely wasn't necessarily what I other people expected me to do with those players. Um, because I think I, at that stage, I think I was too far one way. I think I was so obsessed with players learning in games and had neglected the other little bits of development they might need. So the technical stuff, it wasn't necessarily on my radar. Okay. I think I was a little bit too far one way. And that was at the same point I was studying for my masters. And um, that was when I'd investigated this concept of games. And I was just like, you know, so interested in games and video games and I was carrying out my dissertation for my master's with that particular group of players. And it was an action research study where you know, I'd go to training, deliver, we'd reflect. So the kids would fill in like these little reflection activities straight after the session. So what was on that reflection activity that the kids filled in? Uh, so it was around how did they feel and what did they like? What did they dislike during that particular session? So what elements of the design? So what did you like about the game and why would be like a question that I might have asked them and they'd write down their answers and each week or they could draw pictures some of them drew pictures which were really cool Um, and so I'd I'd have a look at all of that and that would inform how I would deliver and plan for the next session based upon my own thoughts as well and also based upon some of the frameworks that I'd taken from video game design because that was really the focus if I was trying to understand what is it like to play a video game? Can I get my kids to have that same feeling of, you know, wanting to carry on playing, that desire of, you know, when you play a video game, you're like, oh, let me try again. Even if you failed, you're like, I oh, want another turn. Like, you feel like it's, it's within reach, even though you've just died or you've lost a life. Yeah. And um, I was trying to understand how could that, how could I get those feelings how could I get that my practice with my kids in football to replicate what it's like to play a video game? So I went for a whole season of that process of planning, coaching, reflecting, planning, coaching, reflecting. Just and I was using the work of um, James Paul G at Arizona, Arizona State University, who looks into video game design in a lot of detail. And I was using that framework to inform my coaching. Okay. There's so many questions that I okay, want to... No, no, that's good. That's great. And I think that leads us to the point where we first made contact with one another, didn't, doesn't it? Because I think at the time I'd written a, 
um, an article for the Boot Room magazine around video game design, which our editor, Pete Glynn, managed to polish up to <laughs> far better standard than what I, what I was when I gave it to him. And then, and I know you documented your experiences with the with the kids when you were going through this season. Is that right? Yes. It, it, it sounds like this was a quite, a, without putting words in your mouth, which I am now, <laughs> quite a pivotal moment in your own coaching journey. Really was, This, yeah. this season-long commitment to really thoroughly planning... Uh, delivering, um, reflecting upon with uh, involving the players, immersing the players in in that reflection process as well. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, Uh, it really got me thinking around, do I even know how my kids feel after I've, or during their experience with me in a training session? Um, Up to that point, I'd never ask them. Because you think back to when I was was, uh, talking to you about my first experience at the Fulham soccer camp, I just observed their behaviour and they were messing around and being silly and looked like they weren't having fun. I didn't ask them. I didn't ask, what can I do tomorrow to make this more exciting for you? And I just sort of thought about that myself. And this was the first time that I actually used their feelings to inform where I was going with this. So I want want to really drill into the specifics here. I want to get into the video game framework because I'm fascinated with that stuff and I think the people listening in will be as well. I really want to know how how you got the players to be so honest, and I know that at that young age, they it's easier to to get them to be honest. I, I see um, coaches really trying to draw this information out of their own players, and often it's done in a group at the end of the. How was that? How was that, guys? Yeah, all right. How do you feel about that? Yeah, fine. And they're kind of just looking around and thinking, well, when do I get to go? Yeah. Um, so what, what were the real specifics that you did to try and get that quality data off the, off the kids that you were coaching about how they felt about the sessions? And I think the key for me was not to sort of lead them to the answers that I wanted. So you talk about what were the specifics. I'd actually say I, I kind of went down the other route and made it so open that I wanted them to drive that. So it was literally a case of um, asking them to, it was draw a, draw a picture. And are they on their the own? Stuff. Are they as, as group? Is it, are they still outside they at this point? They could do how they wanted, yeah. So they were outside um, yeah. simply because we had nowhere else to go. We were just on the football pitch. Um, and some of them would work together because some of them were quite good mates. So some would just sit on their own. So you gave them complete time, freedom. Whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. And it obviously planned for the last 15 minutes of the session was, was to do that. I had permission, obviously, from the football club. and So you, you had them for, what, an hour, hour and a half? Uh, I think it was an hour and a half. So you did an hour and a quarter, if you like, of traditional coaching yeah. and then the last 15 minutes so you could get them away on time, yeah? Yeah, okay. exactly. And also because I didn't want it to be, oh, two minutes now just to fill this in because it would be a case of just rushing off. Yeah. and So, that yeah, they... They did ask me questions during it. You know, at the start, they From were the like, off, yeah? yeah, at the start, they were kind of like, oh, I don't really know what you mean or what to write. So I had to, to actually, you know, what, what part of that session did you enjoy the most? And as they got better at it, they could identify like little, little features of the session that they liked. So if it was something around um, choosing what goal to score in or deciding um, what team to play against or... I don't know, whatever it was, something that they noticed in how the game was modified. Because I suppose in their head, they have an image of what the actual game of football is, like main, like the usual rules that you play, like the traditional. And then the games that I was putting on were like really modified versions of football. So they could pick out like, oh, that was different to a normal game of football. Did I like that little bit there or didn't I like that little bit there? And then they could, by identifying that, and then just giving me one feeling that they felt in relation to that helped me. So what were the extremes of the, um, the feeling spectrum that you got back from the players then? And then how did, uh, how did your practice um, evolve over that season? It started off, well, in terms of the practice, it started off, I would say, um, lost from my perspective. I didn't know where I was going with it. I was just like... Phew, every week was different like I didn't have a plan in regards to like what I was trying to get out of it um halfway through the season I think it comes back to that that coaching pressure 
where I tried making it technical where I could because I thought that's what coaches, other coaches were expecting me to do. But then towards the end, that was it. That was when I could really say to someone, this is what I'm trying to achieve from these sessions. And it went, kind of went for like really open, too much games, no structure to like technical, to then to the, the end was a balance between it. And you could see that, you know, at the start, the players, the, the first phase of it, players loved because it just looked like it was just turning up and just playing. And that's probably not that, what they were used to in that particular environment. Um, the middle part was a strange one for me because they enjoyed, they seemed to thrive off the technical stuff. Um, they liked the element of sort of taking responsibility for, for how well they do in the game, not having to rely on somebody else. When, when you say the technical with. stuff, are you talking about isolated, isolated individual stuff. work here? Yeah. 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 Okay. So where they'd literally have their own individual technical target. So it could be, you know, finishing with your weaker foot. They love that. But in my eyes, I was like, but this isn't video games. The ideas that I'm trying to get out, this, this isn't even games. So it's frustrating for me in that sense that they seem to love the technical side. So then it was like a process of me manipulating the technical. So there were still decisions for them to make because a lot of the... A lot of the success of video games is because when you're a gamer you have a lot of choice and then that's what initiates that sort of motivation and love for the game so when you were when you so see you were you were getting the feedback weekly from from the girls and you were how, how much of that planning for the next session was based on what they were giving you back as uh or and then balancing that off with what you thought or what you wanted to do, where you wanted to take it. How did that? How did that work? Was it one hundred percent them, one hundred percent you, somewhere? I would say well, it was me and somebody else, um, and I'd say it was quite heavily influenced by us and the theory in the end because we had outcomes and aims of the of the research, and that was to try and break down and unpick what is the design of video games and how does that look in a football context and I think that overrided a little bit sort of the players feedback at the start of that season Mm. because they're telling me they love like lining not lining up but they love just like shooting at the goal repetition Yeah. yeah and in my mind I knew that wasn't it but for that last period of the season I think it was truly yeah. collaborative. And how is it collaborative then? Collaborative, sorry, between um, what they're saying yep. and what we're doing yeah. as coaches. Okay. Getting into the video game design now and the concepts of that, I I haven't been a... You mentioned the word gamer there. I don't think I've been a gamer for a while now. I think the last game that I truly got hooked on was Rock Band. And it came about because I was, I had a really nasty ankle injury. I think I had a, a grade three um, ligament tear and I was out for about six months. And at the time I'd just moved out of home and I was living with uh, two other lads and we had a great apartment and, I, and I'd got this injury and I was, oh, got absolutely devastated. So I went out and, and I bought rock band and I bought the whole lot, the drum kit, the guitar. I even got the microphone in the mic stand and we set Love it up it. with the uh, with the hi-fi system. And m- my mate Dave and I, we, we played that game for, we must have been a minimum of three hours a night for at least six months. He was the drummer, I was the lead guitar and we, we, we got to expert level and... I, I remember actually one time I was in the Trafford Centre and uh, we were actually on a, a, a kids football trip and the kids had gone off with the parents and I'd gone into HMV at the time and I went to, you know, I was bored so I picked up a guitar and started playing rock band and, and I was playing Eagles, the Ho- Hotel California Love it. on Expert and then as the song finished I didn't realise there's a big crowd of people who gathered around <laughs> and gave me a round of applause and at that point I knew you've got to stop this, you're a grown adult so... Yeah. But I, I, I think I, through those experiences of, of playing games, you know, from early on as a, a Commodore 64 or whatever it was, hoping that the tape would load <laughs> to, I know, I see just the adverts for the, the games nowadays. I think I've got an idea of some of the concepts, but 
I really want to pick your brains on, you know, what what have you discovered about the concepts of video games, game design, because it is a multi-billion pound industry now, um, believe bigger than the film industry. Mm. What can we learn as coaches that we can then um, start to incorporate into our own practice? So, uh, So just after that season that we were just describing there, I kind of realised I don't know them. The kids you know, or no, the concepts? The sorry. concepts. Yeah. I could read them from the articles, but I couldn't translate them into practice very well at all. Right. So I was on another mission to understand these concepts in great detail. So, What were some of these concepts then? Concepts specifically. Um, so there's three learning principles that this professor, Professor G in Arizona, that he talks about. It's empowerment, deep understanding and problem solving. So straight away, as a coach who uses a game-based approach, you think, yes, you know, do I give my kids choices in practices? You know, is there elements of decision-making? Yes or no. Do they engage in problem-solving in order to outwit the opposition? Yes or no. And am I helping them to understand the tactics of the game? And I was like, well, them three principles are so prominent in football coaching, or should be. And um, from there, he's got 13 design principles and this is where I found it tricky. So, you know, one of them is this idea of feedback just in time and on demand. This is a particular design feature that he says that's what video games do. So you might be playing a game, playing a video game, and you get feedback when you need it. And I was thinking about coaching and I was like, you know, there's been loads of studies around coach behaviour and how do we support players, when do we intervene, when do we challenge them. And I was thinking to myself, when I'm coaching, I observe the practice as it's playing to, in, to inform how I intervene. But why do I do it like that? Again, I haven't asked the players, do you need my help? I've just said, it looks like you need my help in my head, and then I've come in and helped them. So that was one of the key things that I was thinking about in terms of completely switching it on its head in terms of how coaches traditionally use interventions. So whether that be stop stop their freeze frame or ask a player a question individually or set them a challenge, whatever it is. It's always been driven by the coach. So that, that for me was the very first like, sort of when the penny dropped. And I thought uh, it was really funny actually because I was going into a, to a football club and some of the coaches wanted to understand the video game approach. And so they asked me to come and coach the under 10s at their football club to show them. And I was like, right, okay, it's going to be the first time that I use this idea that the players decide when they want help, not when not, I, I won't decide. Because I'd only thought about that the day before. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. Like pennies dropped, I'm going to come in and do this. And I went out and I bought these tiny little whistles from the pound shop that you can just, you wouldn't even know they're on you. And I got 20 whistles. So I was like, yes, all the players are going to have a whistle rather than me. So they had it, and I was like, yeah, so they're going to have it in their hand while they're playing. And then when they want help, they will blow the whistle to signal that they're going off the pitch to their teammates, but the game carries on. I was like, in my head thinking, this is going to be amazing. Um, and then I got to the practice. Obviously, I don't know the players. It was the first problem. And yeah, they were excited about having a whistle. They were blowing it when I gave it to them. And like, you know, really interested in it, picking their colour, really excited. Game played. Silence for the whole 30 minutes. Did not hear one whistle blow. They forgot. Some of the whistles they just dropped on the floor because they forgot. Mm. I was like, right, that's not worked. And it really made me think about like maybe the players have gone through like a system whether that be school or coaching where they've never had to think about how they're doing whether they need help or whether they need to be challenged because they've always been told told by the teacher told by the coach and it made it even more complex because I was asking them to ask for help whilst they were playing a game so that's a really high level sort of thinking skill to be able to say to somebody that you're playing a game but as the game's playing you've got to recognise when you when you want help that's really hard it's like really like reflection in action it's really really hard 
So that was a big penny drop for me in terms of this is a principle from video games that you can easily do in video games because the player's got the controller in front of them and they know that button's pause. You know, and there's stuff that might be happening around them outside of the game, which means I'm going to pause now because it's dinner time. And then they go and think about how to how they'll play when they come back to it next time. But in that situation of football, it, it didn't work. Um, so since then, I've been experimenting a lot with the under sevens at Fulham around how do I get them to realise how they're doing as they're going along in the game rather than relying on feedback from us. So I've had to structure it into practice now. So it might be a game. And then say after 10 minutes, we, put, we bring them in, in their teams, and sort of got this thing now called the four C's, where I'll have like a whiteboard, and there's a C that says cheat, a C that says challenge, a C that says change, and a C that says clue. And they can choose in their team which one they think they need. So it's kind of like a bit of a balance between, I know that you're not going to ask this unless I pause it for you, but when I have paused it for you, can you choose what you think you need? So I kind of say, like, it was funny because the first time I ever done it, what do you think they chose? <laughs> I don't want to say cheat, but I know what I know about kids and problem solving, but I think you're going to tell me they said cheat, aren't you? All of them screamed, cheat, Did they? Cheat. Yeah, yeah. I want to cheat. I was like, you can only use it once. Do you need it now? And like, some of the players were like, oh yeah, we're, we're, kind of, we're winning. Do we need it now? So even that got them to think about their strategy and think about um, how they're going to progress in the game, which was great. But yeah, they all wanted to cheat. Um, I, I'd already pre-planned what stuff would uh, be. And what was, what was the cheat in this example? Uh, cheat was that you could steal a player from the other team. Okay. So create an overload. And what were the others? There's another one that's quite good where you say skip a level. So for example, um, when I'm trying to use video games in my session, I have like levels, which they have to get through in order to complete the game. So uh, say they're on level two and their opposition are on level five, they might cheat and get up to level three without yeah. having to actually... Oh, and what were the other ones? Was it Clue and Challenge? What were the other ones that, the, of the four Cs that you mentioned? Um, what be oh, examples yes. of those? So we've got Change, which is change the playing area. Okay. To your advantage. So really amazing. I love this example. I was just gobsmacked by the intelligence of this particular player um, there was a game that we were playing where there was locked players were locked in thirds and the thirds were vertical and on the left hand channel there was a boy on the other team who was a left left footed player and his strike was just you know unbelievable most times we were playing without goalkeepers as well um, and the team that decided to change the game by changing the playing playing area, there was this one boy, he said, that player on the other team's getting a lot of success from striking across goal of his left foot. Why don't we move the goals, tilt them away from the left channel so that if he gets the ball in the left channel, he can't use his left foot to strike. He's facing the back the of the goal, yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, I can't believe this. I've been coaching, like practicing and thinking about this for how many years? And you've just come out with the most amazing way of designing a practice to your advantage. This and is I a six-year-old, right? Six years old. Yeah. yeah. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, yeah, yeah. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, yeah, go and do it. Go and do it. And um, it worked. It worked. The boy was so, it was so frustrated. So it's excellent for him as well because... It was challenging him, gave a new problem to that boy, thinking because he was locked in that channel, but he had to think differently around what what do I do now when I get the ball? So I can't just keep shooting. Probably looked more like a cross, did it? It kind of looked like a cross, but sometimes I think most of the time you just play it inside to the midfield, okay, and just would opt not to get a shot off. Okay, great. So so you had that. I mean, my mind's going overdrive here, trying to keep up with um, these concepts. One of the things that you talked about there was the the, the feedback on demand. Um, was that how it was phrased? Yeah. Uh, just in time and on demand. Just, ima- just in time on demand. And that, that's something that I've noticed. You, you saw the story about the whistles and it's something that I, I've, I've noticed uh, when I've worked with 
so for example, CPD events where we've brought players in so that the coaches don't have to run around. And and I've tried some of these concepts to, or tried to uh, show some of these concepts in practice. So one of the things I've used or tried to use often is the idea around the timeout mm-hmm. so that the you know a, a captain or any any player in, in the practice at any moment can call a timeout so that the the teams can come together and reassess we see it often in american sports in futsal um in basketball and it, it's just common practice but in in football obviously that's not the case yeah uh, in video games, however, you know you, you mentioned you've got that pause button, and, and and it's very easy to do. And I've had mixed success, but obviously, again, without having that prior uh, that prior connection, you know, why would you expect the players to to do something so alien to what they've they've already been doing? I suppose. Yeah, and I think also, like, if you're going to put the responsibility on the players to identify what they need, how they're going in the game. They need to have an understanding of where they're trying to get to in the game. So they need to know how to win the game or what the end end goal is, who the final boss is, if you like. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So sort of, um, I realised that as well. There needs to be a reason for them doing it. It needs, to be, it needs to be based around strategy. So one thing I've started to do now with, with sessions is rather than saying, today we're working on playing out from the back or, I don't know, playing forward, whatever it is. I don't say anything like that. So there's no technical or tactical focus to any of my sessions now. So I would just say your mission in today's game is to unlock players from all of their thirds. So if I've got a practice design where players are locked in and that's how the game, that's how the initial game form looks, then all they know is they've got to get to the, they've just got to get to a point where everyone's unlocked. So I'm, from the reason before that is because it's up to them how they strategize and if they've got to a point take the example with the boy who was locked in the left channel but the goal had been spun away from him if that's happened to your team during the game then you have to rethink you know i'm not you wouldn't carry on doing the same thing if the game had changed so that's why I've been steering away from like technical and tactical mm. stuff because I just want them to understand how that might change anyway throughout the game depending on what actually happens in the game. Yeah. I'm smiling here from ear to ear here just thinking about the response that you must get from young players when you start your session with your mission is... Um, <laughs> they fantastic. do like it, they do. So yeah, so we talked about feedback just in time and on demand and you said there was, I think there were 13. Um, so t- tell us about some of the others and, and how you've used those in, in practice as well? Um, something that interests me is this idea of sandboxes. Yeah, it's weird. I, I, when I first read it, I was like, what on earth has that got to do with video games? And it's about um, making something less risky. So um, in video games, so Sonic, I didn't say this at the start when you asked me what my favourite game is because I forgot, but I've just remembered now. Sonic is my favourite ever game and it's the green world. Do you remember the green world level where... Remember it well, yeah. Yeah, and the music, everything. It's, yeah. You know, it's come back out now. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that. In fact, one of the... I'll, I'll call them out here. Anthony Smith from the County FA, County Development Manager, yeah. has um, has just got a Mega Drive for Christmas. Oh, my God. <laughs> With 80 games built in. That is unbelievable. Um, yeah, so this, this Sonic game I used to play a lot of and green world was fine, the first level, I... You know, I could get through the end of that fine. But when I went through the other levels, I think there was a lava level. I can't remember what it was called. I always used to die. And it used to really annoy me if I had forgotten to... You know, the little bell thing that if you run past it and you bell it, yeah. that if you die, you can at least come back to that point in the game. Oh, uh, yeah. And if I'd have forgotten to do that or missed it out somehow, I just used to get so annoyed. Um, so I thought about that in, in football. And I was thinking about um, how do we set up a game so that players, it's like risk alleviated. So there's still risk taking involved because you're still going to be trying certain things when you get the ball or, you know, taking certain risks against certain opponents. But if you were to fail, could you still keep all of the progress that you've already done so far? And you wouldn't lose all of that. Um, 
this is the reason why it's called a sandbox because if you you fall over in the sand pit then it's safe to do so is that yeah. right yeah, yeah okay. exactly yeah. yeah so but I was looking at it more from the perspective of not in a session but over a block or over a certain period of time because I was rem- I was thinking about the conversation I had with Len many years well a few years before about the spiraling yeah yeah so I was thinking, how am I going to get the players to, at the end of training, you know, time's run up, our sessions, you know, it's finished, parents have come to collect us. But then when they come back next week to carry on playing the same game where they left off. So if I knew that, you know, my team, if I was a player in my session and I was on level five and your team were on level six, that when we came back next week, we could carry on playing that same game. And then it... Because I was thinking about Len's conversation about spiraling in the curriculum and not having something new all the time, and I was having about I was thinking about the conversation with the level one coach who said, "How long will this last? Mm. How many minutes should I do this practice for?" And then I thought, well, if we just let it go on until they'd reached the mission, so in the game that example that I gave you until everybody's unlocked, and how, there's seven so, people on the team, yeah, then there'll be probably seven or eight levels. So how, in, in that example then, in that specific example you said about your mission is to unlock all of your players. So how, how would they, how would the players unlock? So that's when I would say that's the part of the game design that maybe is a little bit tricky. Not tricky, but you have to think carefully about. So I've tried one where it's just goals. So it's just like a regular So if you game. score, then you're unlocked. Yeah. yeah. So it could be, we've got 10 minutes of gameplay. Whoever's got the most goals at the end you get to choose a player to become unlocked. Okay, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. It could be that simple, or depending on who you're working with, it could be something a little bit more complex around um, the number of touches your team takes before scoring a goal. It equates to the number of points that your team score. And same concept, 10 minutes, most points. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. Okay. So, so you can manipulate the scoring system. Yeah. To so, and and then that, that would be something then that you would you would play week on week on week uh, until somebody completes the yeah, game yeah until literally until somebody gets to the boss level so that's why I was saying if there's seven players in the team you've got luck on like all seven there could be seven levels but if you wanted the boss level in there then there could be eight levels and they choose that they can well I haven't if I'm honest with you I haven't nailed what that will look what the best idea around is for this boss level thing you've not got there yet I haven't thought of something that's meaningful that is practically applicable as well um because my initial thinking was something around underloads and overloads and sort of really you know exaggerating this concept of um you've got 10 minutes of gameplay in this final level can you be successful with maybe you start with eight players sorry seven versus seven then after each minute a player comes off and then in the end it's like seven players on the opposition's team against your one. I don't know. There's so many different ways, but just something that's really, really tricky for them in the final level. So that sandboxing principle, that that, um, sandboxing element to game design is, is, I can imagine, important because the the players can then see the progress that they're making over time. Yeah, I think so. And I think from a coach's perspective... um, it's important for that longer period of observation to occur in that same environment because when I was telling you before around, well, let's get the players to identify what they need and they'll pause the game and they'll come over and tell us, that doesn't make the coach's role redundant and that's, I think, it's really important. It's, it's, you hear a lot about this, this idea, game as teacher, and in video games, that's actually true. And that that phrase has actually come from video games and been brought into coaching. But it can't be brought into coaching because otherwise we wouldn't wouldn't have a job. We have got a role to play. So I think that it's important that if that longer period of time, that game lasts three or four weeks of training rather than one session, that's the opportunity for the coach to see, to observe how the players are responding to the mission rather than observing and then influencing it's okay let's actually see how they go um the questions i've had back from from coaches around that is then how do i help as a coach because i feel like i'm seeing stuff you know as a coach you see something you're like if only i could just 
mm. give him that little bit of information there and then you know it could all change for him and he could develop like this and that which I think is true but I also think it's going to be quite interesting to understand what is the role of the coach in this and I think it's when you offer out those four C's so if I've said to you Jack what one do you want cheat clue change or challenge I might question you around that or why do you want that had you thought about that you might say can I have a clue and that's when I might put in a little bit of sort of technical or tactical information for you so I'm that longer period of time to see how the players think and evolve, thinking evolves is key for me. And that's what it's about. It's getting players to become good learners. And I can see, uh, you know, you're talking about, was it Professor G? Yeah. The, the three principles around video game design there about the empowerment, the deep understanding and the problem solve. And I can see how they are starting to be woven into this or into your own practice now when because it you know you ask me which one I want well straight away you're giving me empowerment and you're helping me to understand the game or the practice deeper in order to solve the problems that are in front of me yeah exactly that and this whole stuff from from James G is he's never used it in sports but he talks about it just in a broad educational sense and understanding is something that's from teaching games for understanding. But what G talks about, it's not an understanding of the game. That's fine, but it's a higher level understanding of that. It's about understanding how to learn. So just by getting you to become really good at strategizing and then reflecting on your strategy as the game goes along, you might need to completely change strategy at some points, which means that you know you might start playing the game in terms of you might be patient build up play combination play and then towards the end of the game something can play completely different but completely driven by you so really good understanding of not just the tactics but how the game is designed so that you can find success mm. I'm, I'm i'm fascinated with this and i'm keen to try and uh, get a grip on some of the other the tenets that i think you mentioned about the feedback in the sandboxing with are there any others that that you've used or that you think coaches might really benefit from having a knowledge and understanding of? Uh, yeah, so there's this um, particular design feature that's sort of, it's helped me a lot to be fair in terms of uh, the excitement from coaches and, and players when they engage with it. It's the idea of super, superpowers. So James G doesn't call it that, he calls it um, something, I can't remember the phrase, something to do with manipulation. Um, but for me, when I looked at it, it was basically, it was superpowers. So... As I said to you, Sonic the Hedgehog, absolutely loved that game. And the power that I always wanted to get was the fast feet. Do you remember it? Yep. So I knew if I got that fast feet, I could get through that lava. <laughs> I'd just run through the lava. I won't even have to worry about anything. I'd just run through it. I'll be fine. Um, and I was thinking like in, in a football game, if I'm, if I'm saying that my role as a coach is, is to wait for them to ask for help or to ask to be challenged then there needs to be some, some sort of mechanism in the game that allows them to become a little bit better for a short period of time so that they can cope. Because if that wasn't there, then they, you know, if, if you're struggling, you're just going to struggle even more. And this superpower thing came in. I was like, oh my God, yeah, let's try that out. So it was the um, first one I used, I had a bib and I chucked it on the floor in the pitch. And I said, if your team have the ball, someone can pick up this bib. And if you pick it up, it means that you can go anywhere on the pitch. You're not locked into your zone. So taking the example of the game we've been saying. So um, that boy locked in the left-hand channel, you know, he's realised, oh, I can't strike with my left foot across goal. But if I manage to pick up this bib, I can become unlocked and score from anywhere anyway, so it won't make a difference. But the bib's got to be in his channel in the first place. Unless he can reach over. Well, yeah, so they've got to get him there, yeah. So what is so fascinating was watching how you basically, basically differentiate the challenge level in the game without doing much. And it's self-differentiation for the players. So they can just be like, I need that so I'm picking it up so I can do this. And for some players, depending on what the superpower is, you know, if you're a player that's struggling in the game, that can just completely give you that boost and help you to find out the information that you need to find out in order to get to the next level. 
help you to have a greater impact on the game. But the fascinating thing when people use it for the first time I was watching it was that you could see them thinking. Like, you could actually see them, like the cogs turning in their head. And they like notice that their team have got the ball, notice that they could get the bib. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to pick it up. But then where do I go now? Because I'm only going to be allowed this for like the next few seconds, probably. So like just watching their decision when they've got the bib. And then when the opposition gain the ball back, which means they have to drop the bib, seeing the intelligence of the strategy behind players, whether some of them hid it behind the goalpost that was standing there. <laughs> some of them would like chuck it into a zone that they thought was like not as dangerous. Some of them would just drop it and not even think. They completely wouldn't even think about the strategy around how to use that super be like, oh, drop it. Um, and I found that really fascinating because for me, it's like I can visually see how players are thinking. And for kids, I remember I was... The session I told you about the whistles, it was that same session, so I didn't know the players. But there was this one boy, um, the way he used the superpower, he went into the corner of the pitch and used it in the corner of the pitch and just stood there. And I was like thinking in my head, I was like, I just don't get how you've interpreted that tool. And to this day, I still can't. <laughs> I don't know if it was a really stupid idea or something that was so clever that it's just gone over my head. Yeah. And I'm still, still thinking about it. But yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's something from G's work, but something that's just been reapplied into a sort of a yeah. practical way. When I was writing the, the Boot Room article a, a while ago now, I was, one of the things I was quite interested in was scoring systems and whether you're playing against another team or against yourself so there's some, certain games that you um, yeah there's certain games will offer those two differences or that that collaborative feature because obviously you know you and I growing up playing Sonic the Hedgehog it yeah. was us against the Mega Drive yeah, yeah, uh, yeah but nowadays you know the game the gaming world's completely changed where you could be playing somebody on the other side of the world and there's you know I, I hear of I think things like Call of Duty where you've got kids or, or well just players teaming up in teams all around the world to work work with one another collaboratively yeah I, I kind of thought about that as well because a lot of the games so I told you about my half brother who's younger than me he's what's he now 10 and he's like just computer geek and because I've had such a long time away from video games myself I've just been like looking at Ben my brother and it's like what is that you're playing he's like oh I made it myself I'm like what you made this game he's like yeah yeah and like it's this new world he's like made a little world in this game and he knows exactly what the world does and why it does it and who's there and I'm just like wow that, that's amazing and I was thinking about um, how that would look in football coaching and I kind of now like associate the pitch that you're training on and the game that you design as, as the game world and trying to get the players to co-create that with the coach mm. so it's co-design which is I think maybe the design feature that you're alluding to yeah. which G talks about it's the game is not just designed by the game designer it's an ongoing sort of conversation of design depending on how the player plays the game so going back to what I told you about with the the kid that changed how the game looked by providing that like facilitating that choice for him he's changed the way the game looks depending on what he wants to get in the end so yeah uh, there was, there's a common conversation that I have with grassroots coaches mums and dads who and it's a concern that the game doesn't look like what it did when we were growing up. Street football is uh, far less apparent. The kids sit down and, and are playing video games all the time. They're addicted to games. They're not getting out and playing. Where? Do, what's your stance on on that conversation? Um, it's a weird and again another weird one because this t title of a book that I really like says, um, "Don't disturb me, Mum. I'm playing." And I think there's like a misconception around this the word playing and the word learning and not often placed together 
in the same sentence. And for me, like video games, yes, I can understand you are inactive when you're playing a video game, if unless it's something like Wii or the one that you were describing when you're on the guitar and stuff. It was still inactive, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, what video games are really, really good at doing is, I don't want to say they get you, they get you more clever, but they get you to think on like a metacognitive level. So rather than just like uh, playing in general or learning in general gets you to think and it gets you to, to solve a problem or it gets you to, to understand something. What video games get you to do, it gets you to think about why you're thinking what you're thinking. So you get to re- become really good at realizing, at reflecting, reflecting in action, strategizing, solving problems that don't just relate to the game, like the tactics, that relate to a strategy that relate to the people involved in the game, that relate to the task. So if I'm if I'm a really good gamer, I'm going to be able to solve this really tricky problem because I know that what your strengths and weaknesses are. You might be my position. I know exactly what the how the game is designed. So I'm, I know if I do that, that happens. So you're linking in all of these like pieces of information that you found together in order to solve that problem. And there's not very few sort of environments or contexts that are designed in a way that get you to think like that all the time. So like, I can understand, yes, the inactivity side of it, but in terms of those key skills and the translation of those skills into new things. So if I'm really good at meta-level meta problem solving, really good at reflecting in action, really good at strategizing, chances are I'm really good at doing that in school or really good at doing that when I'm playing cricket or really good in other areas of my life with that. And I guess as adults, you know, that's probably some good advice though that, that we should maybe take a balanced view when, when what we assume to be kids are, they're just sat on the Xbox playing games. They're actually developing some real important cognitive skills that, that can be applied elsewhere in life. Yeah. But I guess with anything, it's, it's a balance of that um, that inactivity to physical activity and actually being physically present with, with other friends and and, yeah. uh, and and like anything else you know it sounds like there's a lot of merging of um, contexts so if you look at the way that uh, work uh, work has changed for, for people around the country you've got that the, the notion of the kind of nine to five job um, where you kind of go to the office, come home, is starting to slowly evaporate now. And um, I've got a friend that, that works for, for Google and the the merger between work and home life there is is um, is impressive, but a little bit scary, I suppose, as well. But yeah. And you're trying to do the same, I suppose, within the game and, and the coaching environment is kind of merging the two worlds together. I think, yeah, the best way to describe it is, is merging formal and informal learning. So I think, again, learning has been associated with something that's formal and enjoyment has been associated, associated with something that's informal. So just like getting those two worlds to come together and be like, no, like they both happen and it's that informalness that video games provide. You're, have you completed the PhD yet or are you currently, is this part of the ongoing process? Ongoing talking? process. Yeah, so how far away are you now? Well, I'm 18 months in, yeah. so... Who knows how far away I am, but I'm hoping it's not going to be more than another five years. So. And you've documented a lot of this work, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so um, the first sort of documentation of it was the um, study, the one season long study. But that wasn't part of the PhD, that was part of the master's. So that was sort of really a stab in the dark from my perspective. Uh, and, has that, and has that been published? It's been published. So yeah. where, can, where can listeners find that? Uh, it's the Journal of Sciences. Well, we'll, we'll get a link, we to a link to that. Yeah, we'll put a link up there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the more sort of the, I'd say the better um, stuff to access, which is much more applied to practice, which has um, clarity around what I'm actually talking about, is um, an article that in Quest, which was published in 2017. And what I liked about that was... I used like, actual session plans or game designs and broke them down and actually explained this is the superpower, this is the, the mission, this is how you level up. And I, I talked about because. And I, f- I think that's 
quite handy if, if you're a coach that just wants to know how to how to practice it and how to use it. Like, I mean, um, that was the first bit of work I did as part of the doctorate. So luckily, I had like loads of clever guys around me, just like improving my writing style. So I feel more confident showing that piece of work. Good to stand on the the shoulders of giants. Yes. Yeah. And, and what was the title of that paper in Quest? Um, lessons on video game design. Okay. Learning to play soccer. Okay. And again, we'll we'll, we'll link that one up. Yep. And and you've also done a boot room article. Is that right? Um, yeah. This was two thousand and sixteen, seventeen. I can't remember now. Um, yeah, so it's on video games. It was after your one. That's right. Um, Much better than mine. I think yours was a lot better than mine, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just sort of like an opening idea into the idea of superpowers Yeah. at that point. And again, that's freely accessible, so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll link that one up. That's great. Um, I, I want to just bring our conversation to a close with just some regular uh, questions that we've been asking people that have come on the, the podcast. I mean, I mean, first of all, thanks for... Thanks for that. I, I, my mind's been blown well and truly here with, with ideas that I've got that I want to try my own practice. Uh, so first of all, what would you say is the, the best investment that you've made in your own coaching journey? Best investment that I've made is going out of my comfort zone and coaching players that I didn't think I should or could. So just throwing myself into different environments, to be honest. I know that's really cliche, and it's something that you've probably heard a thousand times. But for me personally, it's just like doing that and talking to coaches who have that experience. What have you seen, read or heard recently that's had an impact on your own coaching? What have I seen, read or heard? Impact on my own coaching recently that I've read is G's work. Um, there's a really good book he's got out at the moment called The Anti-Education Era. And it came out in 2013, I believe. I might be wrong. Could be a bit later than that. It's got a green cover. And I read it when I was on holiday. And it was brilliant. And it talked about um, the problem with education and why people are like why they are because of this system they've been just like put through like a factory line which isn't his idea that's come from somebody else but the way he talks about it in today's world and linking in video games and how important info informal learning is yeah, that sounds like a, a good one to pick up um what advice would you give to yourself now if you were to to your 17 year old self going back starting out coaching um to my 17 year old self i would get myself to plan my sessions less rigorously because after I told you about that situation and I looked over to my colleague's pitch and it looked unbelievably amazing so neat and tidy and everything was perfect I think that made me think that I had to plan meticulously for everything and I've now realised that because it's games and because players should be changing their strategy, altering how they play the game, etc. as they move through the game. I've realised that you can't plan for that. Okay. And, and last one of the regular ones, what, what have you changed your mind about in your own practice? I've, cha I've changed my mind about um, being obsessed with using games all the time, even though I love games, but thinking <laughs> about um, when to use them, why I'm using them, what are the other potential ways of developing players just being a bit more balanced i think it comes back down to we were talking about if you're playing if you're playing a video game um and your kids playing it constantly and you say you're not allowed to play it anymore but just having a balance rather than like, you, you can play it sometimes yeah. so i might use that approach sometimes but i might use another approach sometimes as well yeah and how they shouldn't just be one or the other tapping into that tapping into that and so how has your own reflective practice changed then um, I'm not too sure. I don't, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I really know how it's changed, but I've always been an over-reflector with everything anyway. But for me, like when I use that teaching games for understanding model in the first instance, just realising I don't have to follow it to a T. It doesn't have to be that in every element of what I do. 
and actually I can blend stuff together and it's okay. It might look a little bit unorthodox, but it doesn't matter as long as it gets the outcomes that I want for the players. Yeah. Actually, I'll rephrase that. No problem. Yeah. I don't want to say the outcomes I want from my players because I think that, again, it suggests that I'm the one in charge deciding what you need and how you're going to get there. I think that's a, it's a, a good moment, I think, to, to pull it into a close. Um, I think it's been absolutely fantastic. It's been one of the, my favourite recordings, without a doubt. Um, I've had a smile on my face all the way throughout this one. And I have no doubt that there will be a lot of people out there listening in who have probably got thousands of questions that, that they want to ask you. If, that, if that's the case, how would, they, uh, how would they go about that? How can they connect with you? Um, so I have a Twitter account. Yep which I can't remember the Twitter handle off the top of my head <laughs> um, so you use which is very helpful we'll find it um, or we'll link um, it up. yeah or email or whatever really yeah email would be so it's um, amy.price at stmary's.ac.uk okay and you're you're currently teaching there right yes yeah, so I'm um, teaching on the football education coaching and development and physical and sport education and is that have a is it gamification or gamification does it oh so this is another another sort of uh, can of worms. It's not gamification. Oh, right. Yeah. So How dare I? I <laughs> well, it's, I think, again, in my, when I first started reading around it, that word was coming out a lot. Mm. Um, but I think, and I'm not 100%, but I think gamification is more linked to um, influencing people's behaviour through, like, ways of motivating them. So, like, a Fitbit uh, okay. is a good example. But um, I would call this the video games approach to coaching Fantastic. or teaching, which is more focused around getting players to become good learners of the game and understanding, having a deep understanding of yeah. the game. I, I don't often say this, but when you were describing some of the, the ideas that you've been using and the way that you've been working with your, your young players, in the back of my mind, I was thinking... I, I really want to watch one of these sessions. I'd be willing, I, I'm going to have to drive down to Fulham or find a, find an excuse to have a meeting to come and um, to come and watch your session. I don't know if that's if that's possible. If there's coaches in the local area that want to come and watch watch you work with your players, is that is that something that yeah, yeah definitely. So, um, Fulham are. Well, I I'm saying this on the podcast, and I've actually asked them, but I'm sure I know that they run lots of um, Surrey Coaches Association events down there anyway. Yeah. Um, so yes fine so surreyfa.com uh, have a look on there and see what the CPD events are going on and otherwise contact you directly and find out what you know when you, where you're working there's actually a CPD event in March um, the 7th at the new Surrey FA headquarters in Dorking okay on the video games approach great and there's a grassroots team that are coming in and I will be pestering Pete Augustine to film that one and get it out uh, get it out to a wider audience brilliant Great. Well, uh, Amy, I, I can't thank you enough for this. Um, I hope this has been a good introduction to your your first few hours in the great city of Liverpool. I'm absolutely buzzing. Great. Loving it. And I, uh, I hope you uh, you enjoy the game this afternoon. I'm thank sure you. it'll be a cracker. Yeah. Um, you've picked a, a hell of a, a first uh, game to go to at Anfield. So enjoy that. And, thank you very um, much. Thanks for having me. Are we all right? I think what would be great would be to get a follow up on this maybe when you're further along down the line with your PhD. Would that be something you'd be interested in? Perfect. Yeah, lovely. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you a lot. Cheers. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please help spread the word or leave us a review on iTunes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. You can reach me on Twitter at JackWalton1. And don't forget to follow Liverpool FA at Liverpool underscore CFA. See you next time.